is our, is our um, sixth Sunday on the living the creative uh, life. And um, this, this Sunday is going to be on risk. Next Sunday, we're going to combine the last two together because we missed last Sunday. So we'll see how that works. Um, and then we'll start our um, study on the shack. So if you um, want to take the shack, please sign up because we need to know how many books to order or if there's enough people interested in doing it. Last time I checked, there's one person that signed up. So please sign up and let us know so we can order the books this week. Um, next week, well, with the, like I said, be the end of our um, sermon series on, on this particular one and creativity. I want to thank everybody that has brought their creative items that they have done. You guys have lots and lots of talent here. So the next week you can take them home with you after the worship service, so please do. But please come up. There's been some added um, since the last time we came together. Um, so come up and read, look at some of the creative uh, things, items we have. Um, on Feb February 23rd, Next Sunday, the shack will be played in Osage, and I think we're doing the other one here March 1st. I believe 1.30. I believe it's going to be at 1.30, so keep that, keep that in mind. Are there any other announcements that need to be announced that I may have missed or overlooked? Anything? So let's uh, watch our video. Does hold you back from the courage to make a move. Author Robert Grundon said, Creativity is dangerous. Its pleasure is not the comfort of the safe harbor, but the thrill of the reach, reaching the sail. Sometimes what holds us back is what we are, when we are comfortable. Even if not happy, we simply have gotten used to the way things are. Hear this good news. God has created an ever-expanding universe, and you are part of it. You can expand your world and the world around you by seeing yourself as God sees you able to do far more than you can ever imagine. If you are uncomfortable, it just means you are growing. As our greeting in Passing the Peace today, I invite you to turn to your neighbor, turn to the person you greet, and say, go for it. And if there's a high five involved, so be it. So stand and greet one another with, go for it. Thanks, I will. <laughs> will you join me in the call to worship? Holy God, we have left our homes and warm beds to be in your presence. We gather in your name to worship and praise you. May this first day of the week be holy on many days. Will you praise Will you join me in prayer? Risking God, you created something from nothing opening us to move into the unknown future with confidence so that we might live in your vision for this world. You continue to create. Draw us into your possibilities. Give us the courage to act. Amen.
Let us sing our opening hymn. <clears throat> be seated. Psalm 138. I thank you, Lord, with all my heart. I sing praise to you before the gods. I face your holy temple, bow down and praise your name. Because of your constant love and faithfulness, because you have shown that your name and your, your commands are supreme. You answered me when I called to you. With your strength, you strengthened me. All the kings in the world will praise you, Lord, because they have heard your promises. They will sing about you, have done, uh, and about your great glory. Even though you are so high above, you care for the lowly, and the proud cannot hide from you. When I am surrounded by troubles, you keep me safe. You oppose my angry enemies and save me by your power. You will do everything you have promised. Lord, your love is eternal. Complete the work that you have begun. This time I'll invite the young people to come forward so I have a moment with them. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Good. Good. You know, we've been talking a lot about creating. Do you guys like to create? You guys created some things for me a couple few weeks ago. We have them back there, and along with a lot of other things that have been created. Have you ever made a mistake when you're creating something? Yes. Yes. So do I. So do I. So I want to read you a book today. It says, Beautiful Oops. Okay? Oops. A torn piece of paper is just the beginning. Took that piece of torn piece of paper and made it into an alligator. Yeah. Every spill 
has lots of possibilities. That's an elephant. It's an elephant out of a spill, isn't it? Yeah. Bent paper, see how the paper's bent? Uh. Is something to celebrate. Because look what you can make out of it. Yeah, is that a penguin? Yeah. Yeah. A little drip of paint. See how it's dripped? What's it going to create? You want to pull it down and see? <gasps> it's your imagination run wild. Those drips became pigs and a pig in a car. That's kind of neat, isn't it? A scrap of paper. See our scrap of paper? What's it going to be? <gasps> a dog can be fun to play with. Yeah. He bited it. Yeah. A smudge and a smear. See the smudge and the smear? Can you lift, pull it down? There you go. Can make magic appear. See what he did with the smudge and the smear? It's a bunny. It's a bunny and a fish, isn't it? We can't even see his eyes. Yeah, see, that's part of the smudge. That's part of the smudge. It made it, can you make it into a, take that smudge and make it into a bunny, can't we? Yeah. A stain. See, the coffee, it leaves a stain. What can we do with the stain? Let's see, let's see. Can, you, can you open it up here? There you go. If you play with it, it can make a different shape, can it? Take that stain, you make it into a frog, can't you? Holes, see the hole? Exploring. Are worth exploring, aren't they? Can you see there? Whoa! Yeah. That's pretty neat, isn't it? When you think you have made a mistake, what you can see with the mistake, see what you can do? You can put a flower there, can't you? And he scribbled. Yeah. Scribbled? And it, see, you scribble out the mistake, right? You can put, make it into grass and a tree. See? And oops! What can an oops be? As an opportunity to make something, open it again, let's see what it is. Beautiful. What did he make out of the oops in the paper? He made out of sheep, didn't he? So we make oopses, don't we? We make mistakes. And that's all right, because we can take those mistakes sometime and make them something beautiful, can't we? So don't be afraid to do things, to try things new, okay? Because just like they were, did things in here, we can take some of those things and make them beautiful, okay? Let's bow our heads in prayer. A gracious and loving God, we know that we make mistakes, that we have oopses, but don't let that stop us from trying to create and trying to be what it is that you want us to be. May we use those oopses and those mistakes to make something very beautiful. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you. You can go sit down now. Matthew chapter 25, 14 verses, verses 14 through 30. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there was a man who was about to leave home on a trip. He called his servants and put them in charge of his property. He gave to each one according to, his, to their ability. To one he gave 5,000 gold coins, to another he gave 2,000, and to another he gave 1,000. Then he left on his trip. The servant who had received 5,000 coins went at once and invested his money and earned another 5,000. In the same way, the servant who had received 2,000 coins earned another 2,000. But the servant who had received 1,000 coins went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The servant who had received 5,000 coins came in and handed over the other 5,000. You gave me 5,000 coins, sir, he said. Look, here are another 5,000 that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share <clears throat> my happiness. Then the servant who had been given 2,000 coins came in and said, You gave me 2,000 coins, sir. Look, here are another 2,000 that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said the, his master. 
You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant who had received 1,000 coins came in and said, Sir, I know you are a hard man. You mean you reap harvests where you did not plant, and you gather crops where you did not scatter seed. I was afraid, so I went off and hid your money in the ground. Look, here is what belongs to you. You bad and lazy servant, his master said. You knew, did you, that I reap harvests, harvests where I did not plant and gather crops where I did not scatter seed? Well, then you should have deposited my money in the bank, and I would have received it all back with interest when I returned. Now take the money away from him and give it to the one who has 10,000 coins. For to every person who has something, even more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But the person who has nothing, even the little that he has, will be taken away from him. As for this useless servant, throw him outside in the darkness. There, will, there he will cry and gnash with his teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O oh, gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I have a question for you this morning. Are you a risk taker? Do you know someone who is a risk taker? I see some of you looking at one another, so I think we have a few risk takers maybe. There was a young man who listed in the 82nd Airborne Division, and he was assigned to the jump school. He eagerly asked his recruiter what he could expect it from jump school. And the recruiter said, well, it's three weeks long. And the soldier asked, well, what else? He said, the first week, they separate the men from the boys. And the second week, they separate the men from the fools. And the soldier asked, and what about the third week? The third week, the recruiter said, the fools jump. <laughs> Does jumping from an airplane appeal to you? Would you ever want to do it? Are you one of the fools? Well, as some of you know, I've told before, I've been one of the fools that have jumped from a plane. It was something I always wanted to do. It was a gift from a friend. I'm not sure if it's your friend really or not. I'm after giving a gift that way. But it was wonderful. Some people came to watch me. And uh, most people want to know why you'd want to jump out of a perfectly good plane, but trust me, the plane I got into maybe wasn't as perfect as what some people think. In fact, when we walked over to the plane, we were all ready to go. The person I was going to be tandem with forgot his goggles, so they shut the plane off. And so then someone ran and got his goggles for him. They went to turn the plane back on, and it wasn't quite coming on well. And the, and the person I was diving with says, well, pull the choke. And the pilot yelled back, there is no choke. And so we finally got the plane going. We started down the, down the um, runway, the grassy runway. But trust me, the only thing between me and the outside was a piece of plastic over the door. And I'm thinking, oh, we get up in the airplane, and they roll up the piece of plastic. And I look out and says, what if I fall out? And I was like, duh, I'm going to fall out. I'm just I'm intentionally going to fall out. So I get kind of used to being up in the air and seeing the ground going further and further and further away. And um, he closes, finally closes down the, the plastic a little bit for a little while, and then he rolls it back up, and I look out again, and we're further up, and I'm thinking, all I'm thinking is what the instructions he gave me. He said, when you go, when you get to the door, lean back over my shoulder and tuck your feet under the door, or under the bottom of the plane. So I get there, and that's all I'm thinking of, and all of a sudden, we pushed out. And trust me, the scariest part was the falling out of the plane. After that, it was the most exhilarating thing you could ever do. The wind brushing in your face, and you're falling, free-falling through the air. Trust me, it's exhilarating. I know someone is shaking their heads and saying, no way, no how. And then when he pulled the string for the, the parachute to go up, it was like dead silence in the air. You couldn't hear a thing but each other. And then he handed me the controls to the parachute. 
and taught me how to fly it with, it, it takes a lot of strength to pull that, more strength than I thought it would. And we got to twirl around to a 360, we did a couple dives, and then he took it back and he said, I'm going to make it feel like it's weightless. Your weightless. And I don't know how we did it, but it felt like there was absolutely no weight, no gravity. And then we uh, came down to the ground, and, um, and uh, he turned to me and said, would you do it again? And I said, yes. I would definitely do it again. It was exhilarating. But there was a risk in taking that, of jumping out. But after you take that risk, the exhilaration that you have in doing something. Some of you may mean more like a six foot eight inch man who uh, applied for a job to be a lifeguard. He, uh, he stepped out to the counter and said, I'm here to apply for the lifeguard position. And the recruiter said, can you swim? And the six foot eight uh, applicant said, no, but I can wade pretty far out. <laughs> now the six foot eight, he might be able to do that without taking too much of a risk. I'm amazed at some of the risks that young people take um, nowadays uh, in the, the so-called extreme sports. There was a young guy um, who was a skateboarder who jumped over the Great Wall of China. He, he became the first person in history to clear the wall without a motorized aid. This 30-year-old da Danny Wei missed his first try. But then he completed the jump across the 61-foot gap four different times. On his last three attempts, he added 360 degree spins. His effort was made possible by the mega ramp, a significant, a great big structure that he built near his home in South, Southern California. He said, I always, I was aware of the danger and my heart was pumping in my chest the whole time. Several thousand people, including the China's Ministry of Extreme Sports, gathered to witness this magnificent thing this jumping of the wall near Beijing. Now see, that's amazing to me. First of all, he, has, he was successful, and secondly, that he would take such a risk in the first place. So my question is, how about you? How big a risk are you willing to take? When we dare to dream God's dream and, and hover over that dream to discern what we specifically are being called to do, then we are always called to take some kind of risk. Risking is not so much the next baby step in the process, but a, but a great big step of faith, a leap of faith. Since God respects our free will, anything we ask God that would supersede that will of another person is off the table, though. So anything that might appear good but could cause harm to ourselves or to another is off the table. Praying for something is a risk. But at some point, we have to take that step, we have to take that step in faith, trusting that if we've done our work properly, we will be powerfully assisted. If we call, are called to discern God's will, we will also be assured that God's view of the, of the playing field is much larger than our own view of the playing field. There's always another way forward for those who stay uh, open to, to seeking ways and discerning God's ways in our life. This is one of the great advantages of being a person of faith. It's not that God loves you more and that any more than a person who is without faith, or that God is less willing to help a non-believer. That's not it. The advantage of someone who has true faith as opposed to blind faith is that they are going to be more willing to take the risk to, risk to follow the deep intuition God sends us. They see their lives as a partnership with God, not merely as a private affair. So we're more willing to take those risks. The relationship between faith and risk is the one of things that Jesus seems to be trying to teach us in the parable of the talents that we just read here this morning. Let's take a closer look at this um, often misunderstood parable. You see, a talent of money in Jesus' day, a talent uh, was, a, was a unit of money. It was worth a day's wages of laborers and and taking the Nebraska's minimum wage of $9 an hour as a baseline for a day's labor and, a, and assuming an eight-hour workday, a single talent today's dollar would be worth approximately $432,000. Mm -hmm. 
So this was no small amount of money for the master to be thrown around with his servants receiving between one and five talents. And the servant Jesus, Jesus' parable makes God look like a greedy tyrant who, who compels us to take risks to increase God's resources so that we won't be thrown into the darkness. That's what happened to the guy who plays it safe by burying his talent in the ground. Bear in mind that the third servant hadn't lost the master's money and certainly hadn't squandered it like the prodigal son or the dishonest um, steward in Jesus' other parables. No, he simply preserved the principle in, intact for his master's return. No gain, but no loss either. And it hardly seems fair in our scripture. But part of our confusion comes from the fact that the parable really isn't about money. Troy Broxson, in his book, suggests this. He says he recommends that when we try to discern the will and the activity of God in our world, we put a halo on it. That is, we try to look out at the world through the eyes of God, and if God is actively involved in helping to manifest God's dream for the world, something, the simple act of envisioning a halo, the sacred symbol of holiness, floating over something, we feel it is important for, that, for the fulfillment of God's dream, serves as a way of adjusting our focus, our prayer, our energies, our creative thoughts in a way that helps us, that helps that dream become reality by the fact that we put a halo over it, something sacred over it. Instead, the three servants in our parable uh, being given vast amounts of money, imagine that they get an abundant amount of grace also. Instead of looking at the money they got, think of it in terms of grace. The first two servants not only receive grace, but take risks with the grace that they've received. How do you take risks with grace? You bestow grace by being generous with people in a way that exceeds what they have justly earned or could rightly expect. Or are you refrain from punishing people or taking something away from them when you have every right to do so? The reason why grace can be risky is because it is meant to um, bring transformation, to turn people into gracious individuals who give grace as they have received it. But it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes people who receive grace just take advantage of you. Therefore, if you want to, to multiply the grace you, you have yourself or received God's investment in you, you've got to constantly be taking risk with it to make up the fact that, that not all risks are rewarded. I want to, for example, I served a church that um, was very much... Um, invested in the Women at the Well. Women at the Well is, is a church that's within inside the walls of a Mitchellville prison. They volunteered there a great deal every week. They, they helped out. And when one inmate needed some help after um, um, getting out of prison, they helped her. They bought her a car so she could have a job. They did some other things for her. And what, they invested their time and money into her. But she ended back in prison again. They were very disappointed at what happened. But they said this, they would do it all again. Because that is what God calls them to do. To invest in others, believe in others. Even if sometimes it doesn't work out the way that you expected. They still cared, they still wanted to help. You see, the third servant who took the master's gold and buried it in the ground, did so because he was afraid. He was afraid of what might happen. He was afraid of risk. And that's a common experience, that fear. I wonder how many of us fail to be the people God has called us to be because we're afraid. We're afraid of that risk. Some of us are afraid of what other people might think. That often happens to, to us when we are, we're young. We may do the things that, that we know we shouldn't do because we want to fit in. We, we want to be cool, right? But it doesn't stop that with, with the teenage years. As we get older, we may be uh, may given a, a, a forgetful witness to our faith because we don't want our friends to think that we're some kind of religious nut. Someone, someone might crack a joke, a racist joke, but we put, a, put on our social smile and we even give a pleasant chuckle and even though it makes us uncomfortable. 
We don't want to offend our friends by expressing our annoyance or anger at their racial joke. We're afraid of what others might think. For some people, this is the dominating fear in their lives. The, the third servant who took his master's gold and buried it in the ground, you see, was afraid of risk. He was scared. He buried his master's wealth because he was afraid. Turning to the third servant, he receives liberal amounts of God's grace, but never risks it on anyone. He never gen is never generous towards the undeserving, nor does he turn the other cheek. Nor does he turn the other cheek when someone offends him. This third servant who buries God's grace in the ground has no interest in living with God's dream. He has ex 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 he expects God to live within his dream. For this man, it is impossible for God to be God, for he expects God to play within his boundaries but his, by his rules and to act according to his own limits, understanding how the world should work. And that's not the way God's grace works. Because the man isn't generous himself. He can't accept that God would be generous. He believes God to be harsh judge and he acts in fear. The master effectively responds, that's the biggest bunch of cockamamie story I've ever heard. And God doesn't need to throw this man into the outer darkness. You see, this man is already there. Neither receiving nor giving grace, the third servant has locked himself out of the party God is trying to throw. I'm convinced that that uh, kind of God uh, people have, de have determined and how they see God determines how they're willing to risk things uh, for God. If you are here this morning out of fear, you probably don't enjoy worship very much. If you're here because you're afraid that God will punish you if you stay home, no wonder there's so, much, so little joy and power in your faith. God is looking for people who love God and enjoy God and who are willing to do great things for God. I read about a priest in Africa who faked a crime he did not commit to, to get himself into prison so he could minister to those he, he, he seen needed the most in need. Have you ever, do you have that kind of faith? How much are you willing to risk for God? A former police officer from the Los Angeles Police Department tells how the department would demonstrate a rookie officer's, officers the value of the bulletproof vests that they, they had been issued. The vests were placed on a mannequin, and then the officers would fire rounds into the vest. The rookies would, at, would then be asked to go check and see if, if any of the rounds had penetrated through the, the vest, and, and it did not. The vest would, would pass the uh, test uh, with flying colors. Then the instructor in charge of the demonstration would turn to the rookie officer and ask, so who wants to wear the vest and let us see how many times we can shoot at you and see if it works? Now, see, that's a real test, isn't it? So we have real tests of faith. It's one thing to see a mannequin get shot in the chest wearing a vest. It's another one you have to put it on your, and, and put it on yourself and put your own life on the line, trust in the same vest. Following Jesus means walking by faith, not by fear. Following Jesus means trusting in God. Following Jesus means seeking to hear the master say, well done, good and faithful servant, because we're attempted great things for God. And it involves risk. It's not only for individuals, but it's for churches. What is this church willing to risk for God? Every great advance in life involves some kind of risk. Every advance in this church involves some kind of risks. How big of a risk are you willing to take for God? How big a risk is this church willing to take for God? The only way out of stagnation and darkness is to take a risk. God's realm is grace. And his enduring commitment to you is that grace. You just have to trust it. We have assurances that if we keep turning our struggles over to God, God has more endurance than we do. 
It is God's will to find a way. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, we are so thankful that you are there to offer us grace and help us to take those risks as individuals and as a church together to offer grace outside these walls and the risks that it takes. And maybe we will be willing to take those risks to continue your love and grace in this world and continue your kingdom. Be with us as we struggle uh, with, our, with our faith and being risk takers. And may we truly see you beside us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our next hymn. Now come together as a community of faith to share with one another our joys and concerns so that we can be in prayer for each other this coming week and also so we can lift them up to God. The joys and concerns you'd like to share this morning? I would like to say thank you for all the prayers for myself and for Richard. I'm doing well. Richard is having a tough time. He had, because of the brain injury, he had a slight stroke and he cannot walk or stand yet. Okay. But he's trying. 
So for both you and Richard, but especially for Richard now, you're doing fairly well, and Richard is still struggling a little bit. He's in rehab, right? In rehab, so he's, um, we'll keep continuing to pray for him, so for that. Lord, in your mercy. How about others? Yes. I saw some pictures. It was beautiful, the color of the wind. Big, beautiful kites. I saw some. So, so for that. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Ruth had a procedure done this past week, and I think she's home now. So let's continue to keep her in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, he used to sit over here, yeah. So if David Gardner, who passed away, let's keep um, his uh, family in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. How about others? If not, then let us um, sing our prayer song. <laughs> Gracious and loving God, you are the God of all people. Every new day is a chance to live a, a stronger faith, a more committed and disciplined life, and an opportunity to strengthen ourselves for the work ahead, an opportunity to take risks in our faith. We come to this place not because we want to come and see the church building itself, but because we want to come and see the church, the people who are gathered here. We have designated this building as your house, and, and it only becomes the church when we are here in the, as a community, preparing for worship and heart and ready to serve in body. We bring all of ourselves, those parts uh, fully alive, ready to show those around us and those parts that are hidden and broken. We recognize we carry all these things in our hearts, and we lift them up to you. As we gather in, in the spirit of community, we bring all of ourselves to you, those things that we partake, partake in joy, those things we mourn over that put them in your hands. Oh God, we understand that this journey of living and sharing the gospel is not an easy one. Our world preaches that we cut corners, but when we truly honor and love your people, we, to cut corners to treat our neighbors not like neighbors. This life is a life dedicated to you that has consequences on how we should live. We seek to embody this life of the gospel ready and, and truly help us recognize that it all begins with a life rooted in you. We recognize our responsibility not as an overestimate or underestimate how we live with you in our lives. Let us truly discern and learn what that means to all parts of our lives. We pray to be like Jesus, the one who is rooted in life with you, the one who taught us this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time we invite the ushers to come forward to receive our morning tithes and offering. join me in prayer. This is our creative spirit in the world. This is our offering. May we see things we do, no matter how small or mundane, as the way we contribute goodness to the world, creating more life, more joy, more love. These offerings we bring continue to create. Praise be to God, the creator of all of this. Amen. May you see the unfolding of each day as an opportunity to be a co-creator with God. As a Jesus follower, may you feel his company leading you towards creating more kindness, justice, and mercy. May you know the nudge of the creative spirit within, making belief in all that you are and do. Go in peace. Amen.